Left hand lead by Ali. Left hook, and Ali is down. A left hook by Joe Frazier. Joe Frazier is Rocky. <laughs> It was a small piece of leather that was well put together. I was afraid of Joe Frazier. I know where to hit you, how to hit you, how hard to hit you. He could break your ribs. He would bring out the truth in his opponent. There's no Ali without Frazier. There's no Frazier without Ali. That was the greatest fight of the century. But that's the name of the game. Get him before he got me. Something's what's wrong with daddy? He never left nothing behind. He only made one, and that's Joe Frazier. There's only one Joe Frazier. The winner and still heavyweight champion of the world is Joe Frazier. I'm at. I'm traveling around the world. This is my home. I'm comfortable there. I can go upstairs, my gym clothes on, and work out for 30 minutes straight without stopping. A little music on, music is my timekeeper. And I uh, keep on going. We're talking about over 30, 40 years now with that gym. I mean, you know, and he's right there. It's in the heart of North Philadelphia. It's just like being, being home, I'm here. What I have to be done, I do. For 40 years, Joe Frazier has called this gym his home. Now his body and voice show the strains of age. But Joe's still in the game, training local kids in a neighborhood that's seen better days. The gym, I think, has a great purpose in North Philly to get a lot of kids out of the street. Joe built the gym for that reason. It's a rough and bad neighborhood, and there's a lot of things that the kids can get into after school. And Joe loves to see the kids come in and uh, work hard. He stays with them all the time and wants to see the kids do well. Uh, if he see you doing something wrong, he'll step in. He'll step in and teach you and, like, point it out. He'll even get on the bag and, and do it with you. Ooh, statue. Ooh, statue. There you go. I come here because I got a lot of free time, and my free time, I, I'd rather be coming here to train rather than going out there, and who knows what can happen. I think that the kids would more appreciate that, that they see somebody concerned about what they're doing and how to do it. And we walk away to turn our head, act like we don't see. That's wrong. But the leg, what the legs. My bad. My bad. It's about uh, community. It's about touching lives. It's about changing lives. 
but it, it starts with uh, uh, telling them, you know, what are you going to be? Right there. Right. Let me see that jab, you know. Not bad. Jab right on left. Get that leg right. Jab right on left. Jab right on left. Uh, you have to make your mind up on what you're going to plan for life. And, you know, you can't even have time to just think about it. Let's get the job done and do it right. Born in 1944, Joe Frazier grew up in South Carolina, the youngest child of 11 in a family of rural sharecroppers. They most what you would do with farm work, you know. My mother worked on the farm, my father worked on the farm. They would go to work like 6 o'clock in the morning and come back like 8, 9 o'clock at night. They saw that we went to school, went to church. Mom took us to church every Sunday, and you had to sing. Hey, man. Hey. Hey, man. Hey, man. Hey, man. Let the, let the people in the back say, hey, hey, man. <laughs> I, I love it. After Reuben Fraser lost his arm in a shooting accident, Joe became his father's close companion, running errands with him on the farm, making moonshine in the backwoods. That's how he learned to drive at such an early age, because he would drive the truck, but he would be sitting in my dad's lap. I grew up under dad's arm. I went everywhere he went. I mean, I had a good time together. I learned some good, I learned some bad, but never nothing ugly. We're looking forward to a slashing heavyweight battle tonight. Watching the Friday night fights on TV, Family members noted Joe's physical resemblance to legendary champ Joe Lewis. Taking their words to heart, Joe made a punching bag out of corn cobs, moss and bricks, and hung it from a tree. I had to work like an hour every day um, on that bag. Mom gave me that right to work an hour. You know, a lot of people brush him off. You Go ahead, boy. You know, you, you know how we do. They probably never thought that I would got this far. You know what I mean? Because, you know, it wasn't nothing like that in the facility. Determined to develop his skills in the ring, Joe left school and moved north at age 15. He settled with relatives in Philadelphia, a boxing mecca, where he began training at a police athletic league gym. He wanted to make, make sure that he made something out of himself. I was very, very happy that he chose the box because if he didn't, I don't know where he would have gone. <laughs> I knew what I really wants to do. I know that I want to put them gloves on and be champion of the world one day. Joe's childhood sweetheart, Florence Smith, joined him in Philadelphia, where they married in 1962. To pay the bills, Joe worked at a slaughterhouse, practicing his jab against slabs of meat and staying in shape by running the streets of the city. I used to run from where I lived to the job early in the morning, I had to put it to the clock, like four o'clock in the morning. Four o'clock in the morning, I had to be on the kill floor. He was the original Rocky, I think they said, pounding the meat and then running up the art museum step. From there, uh, they went on to do amateur fights, and he won all of them. Knockout, 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 knockout. Joe won the Golden Gloves three years in a row. In 1964, he became a sparring partner for U.S. Olympic heavyweight contender Buster Mathis. When Mathis hurt his hand in training, Joe took his place. There were like 12 boxes from America, and everybody lost. 
besides me. And so therefore, I felt like this. Somebody had to bring a gold medal back to the United States. In the Olympic semifinals, Joe broke his left thumb. He kept the injury secret from officials, going for the gold with a fractured fist. At that point, you know, if he told them, he, he would have been disqualified. I had to go back in there and fight with a busted thumb. I know if I'd hit him one time, he was in trouble. <laughs> and when I came back, I had a gold medal. Joe Frazier was an Olympic champion. Soon, he'd be fighting on the biggest stage of all. Almost ready for the fight of the century. That fight was the greatest sporting event of all time. He said he was God. I said, Lord, you're in the wrong place tonight. Thank you. After winning an Olympic gold medal with a broken thumb, Joe Frazier returned to Philadelphia, confident that his future was secure. I've had a gold medal around my neck, and I still couldn't get the proper management that I need. He was an afterthought even going to the Olympics and coming back from the Olympics, for that matter. They said I was too short, I was too small. The big guys would eat me up for lunch, dinner, breakfast, and supper. <laughs> but veteran trainer Yank Durham saw things differently. He and Joe struck out on their own. Joe learned to respect Yank early on, and Yank learned to respect Joe for what he was early on, you know, more like a father and a son team. With Yank in his corner, Joe developed his signature style, closing off the ring, then connecting with power. If you was in my range, I was gonna straighten you out with that right hand. The left hand was a, a missile. I get fired from middle way and get you. If you're getting hit with clean shots, you're going to give it up. What Joe had to do, he had to weave, weave, and come in on a, on a weave. Never stops, you know, like a locomotive train. That's why they call him Smoke, you know? In 1967, Muhammad Ali was stripped of his title and banned from boxing for refusing military induction on religious grounds. With Ali on the sidelines, Frazier filled the void. Most of the way. That was probably the best right of the fight by... He took on all comers and captured the heavyweight crown. And Frazier is proving himself a great fighter. Tremendous left hook. He gets stronger and stronger, and the people who are beating him, by exhaustion, he keeps ducking and hooking. And finally, he's overcome you. He's knocked you out. And got Ramos in trouble on the rope. And Ramos has died. Then, in 1970, the Supreme Court upheld Ali's religious rights, allowing him to return to the ring. Now the two undefeated champions squared off for a battle like no other. They represented the divisions in the society at the point at that point. Don't worry about Joe Frazier. I still have amnesia or something. Forgot how good I was. I'm gonna refresh in your memory tonight. We saw it as a battle between the shining knight, Muhammad Ali, who was a political martyr, who was the real champion, who was the one deserving of all the attention and the accolades, and this substitute. How you doing, Al? Hey, how's everything? Uh, how's your hands okay? Oh, yeah, everything's good. <laughs> <laughs>
Frazier had befriended Ali during his exile, publicly supporting his right to fight, privately lending him money to survive. But once the match was set, Ali cast himself as a symbol of black pride and Joe Frazier as an Uncle Tom. Ali always teased him that he was the white man champ, you know, and he was for the black folks. Nobody lobbied harder for Ali to get the chance to come back than Joe. Joe Frazier, the heavyweight champion of the world, clumsy, ugly, black-footed Joe Frazier. I'll show you what a real champion is. When Ali began to humiliate him in promotion for the fight, Joe felt brutally betrayed. I go to bed at night, and I, I could see him in the eye fight. Round to round. Wake up next morning, wet up, sweat. <laughs> I fight him all night long. The first time that Joe Frazier and Muhammad Ali were ever in a ring together was in Joe's gym in Philadelphia. I got them head to head, and I said, let's make this look like you guys are really fighting the night of the fight. So Muhammad hits Joe a couple of taps, and Joe hits Muhammad a couple of taps, and Muhammad hits Joe a little harder. Joe hits Ali smack in the belly, and Ali goes against the ropes. And Joe says, that's the way it's going to be the night of the fight. I have predicted, I have analyzed it, I have fixed up the round that Joe Frazier will go down. He was trying to make me afraid of it. No. I wasn't afraid. While you're being examined, was all that hollering bothering you? Yeah. I didn't even hear any hollering. Who was that here? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to send him a couple of my bodyguards. <laughs> Make sure he show up on time. But as the buildup to the fight reached a fever pitch, Joe's family received death threats. They will tell my dad that, you know, you know, I'll blow up your house, I'll, I'll destroy your family. Everybody says, well, you know, it's publicity. But you weren't on the end of the publicity. I went to the camp worrying about my family. But uh, it never stopped me one day of thinking about getting my job done. Where I've been eating and resting real good and drinking a little water. I feel fully strong, no way tense or nothing. If Joe Frazier me, I'm gonna get on my knees, get on my knees and crawl across the ring, look up at him and say, you are the greatest, you are the character of the whole world. March 8, 1971. The fight of the century. A sellout crowd at Madison Square Garden. 300 million others tuning in from around the world. I can still hear the roar that went up. All could hardly believe this was going to happen. And here it was. Ahmed Ali on the red trunk, Joe Frazier in the green trunk. Joe just went in like a truck, like a tank. All the things that he had in mind to get the job done, I took advantage of that. Good one, two, and a jab. Now Frazier is mimicking Ali. He's just smiling at him. Said he was going to knock me out in, I think, the sixth round. If anybody is psyched here, it is not Joe Frazier. Look at that hook. And when they got to that round, I said, hey, ain't going nowhere. You got your lunch? <laughs> Frazier is just laughing at him, talking to him. That's the way Muhammad Ali used to taunt his opponents. In the ninth round, Ali punished him with a tremendous amount of punches. Ali comes back. He's got a great reserve. The eleventh round, he staggered. If the rope wasn't there, he was gone. That night, Joe Frazier was about as good a fighter as anyone has ever been ever in the ring. 
Time is important here. We laughed when Ali viciously called him an Uncle Tom. Looking back, I almost get satisfaction now from watching Joe land that left hook in the 15th round. He said, if I whip him that night, he would get on his knee, go all across the ring, and say, you are the greatest. But he didn't do that. He was, I think he was trying to get to the hospital. Joe Frazier had won the fight of the century, but his battles were far from over. Joe Frazier beat Muhammad Ali. Who could possibly beat him? Something's wrong. Something's wrong. What's wrong with Daddy? After beating Muhammad Ali in the fight of the century, Joe Frazier was determined to be the people's champ. I wants to talk to the world. I wants to see the world. I never had a chance to go wherever I want to go because I was so busy. So now I got that job done, I just want to go and do things that have fun. The purse from the fight made Joe a rich man. He and Florence moved to the Philly suburbs with their five children. He's a loving father, caring father, um, but the law, you knew not to uh, go but so far. Um, and if you did, he would let you know that he would send you back to Jesus. He would say, you know, there's no wrong way to do right, no, no right way to do wrong, son. He didn't want to put us on a pedestal to make us think that we were better than anyone else. We just had a little extra blessing here because Daddy worked a little bit harder. He goes right after Frazier, but he's missing punches. Joe's setting him up in close from left and right, a wicked left. Frazier fiercely defended his crown. To fellow fighters, he seemed all but invincible. I'd seen him knock Muhammad Ali down, run over contender after contender. I kept thinking, as long as Joe Frazier's heavyweight champion of the world, I won't have much of a chance. I kept hoping he'd die. <laughs> And guys say, well, well, my dad can beat your dad. Another guy said, well, my dad can beat your dad. And I stood up and said, well, my dad can beat all y'all dads because he's Joe Frazier. You know? <laughs> In January 1973, Joe took his son Marvis to Jamaica to see his first fight, a title defense against George Foreman. I was afraid of Joe Frazier. For the first time entering into the ring in a fight, I was afraid of a guy. This contest for the heavyweight championship of the world. Foreman was in the ring and my dad was in the ring. Up, puts the jab on his chin, bangs the hard right hand of the body, pulls his leg and pulls his the right to the jaw. And I'm saying that nobody in the world could beat my dad. One minute to go on the round. When my father fell the first time, I started laughing. I was like, Daddy, stop playing, Daddy, stop playing. Why are you there playing? When my father fell the second time, I got mad. I was like, Daddy, stop playing, man. Why are you playing, man? Stop that playing. He's taking the mandatory eight count. Frazier was down from a short right. Something wrong. This guy got too much power of me. What I'm doing wrong. He's got more than half the round to go. Down again. After the fourth knockdown, I realized I'm getting my butt back. <laughs> Frazier will 
is locked. The reality hit me, man. Man, daddy's not playing. And that was the first time that I realized that my dad was human, that he was just like any other man. Just like that, Joe Frazier's reign was over. Seven months later, trainer Yank Durham died suddenly of a heart attack at age 52. I missed him. No, yeah, but uh, you have no control. That's a good man calling. Me and you got to do the same thing one of these days. In 1974, Frazier and Ali met for a 12-round rematch. Though neither was a champion anymore, the bout filled Madison Square Garden and ended in a decision for Ali. A decision that could have gone either way. Uh, the, the judges, the crowd, the stars, the universe, the stadium, they all gave the fight to Ali. Because Ali was Ali. He couldn't lose twice to Joe Frazier. But in or out of the ring, Ali versus Frazier was still primetime drama. Joe, Joe, you know for real that you are whooped, you? know you? for real. How are you going to catch me and hit me, Joe? I'm too fast. I'll be smoking right on you. Right I'm going to be pecking and a poking, pouring water on your smoking. Hey, Clay. What hey, you Clay. call me? Clay. I think people were willing to watch a weekly Joe Frazier, Muhammad Ali fight. I think if they were on every week, people would watch. And I want you to come out smoking, you hear me? Yeah, I see Chump. Be good. Listen to me. I'm going to hold you to it. Go him. ahead, Chump. I'm going to talk to you when I whoop you. In 1975, Frazier and Ali came to the Philippines for their third and final bout, the Thrilla in Manila. As fight night drew near, Ali let loose with another barrage of insults. Yeah. I have Joe Frazier over there. <laughs> <laughs> I said, all, all, all Negroes look like that? <laughs> for Ali, all the taunting and name calling was, was, was part of the game. And Joe couldn't take it in that way. My father had a lot of anger, man. He was like, why is this guy doing this? The contract is signed. We made the money. The seats are filled. Why does he keep jabbing me, jabbing me, jabbing me? There's a lot of old crazy wrong stuff went down that he knew about, and he didn't do anything about it. Joe had more than insults to worry about. High blood pressure and arthritis were breaking down his body, while a cataract rendered his left eye all but blind. He would have elbow problems, shoulder problems, back problems, and I would frequently have to inject him and things like that. And I had to go to Manila with him for that reason. I knew I was going blind, but I had the dream of being a champion since I was a little old boy. So I was, I was too far gone to change my mind. <laughs> With trainer Eddie Futch in Joe's corner, Frazier and Ali gave it all they had, battering each other round after round in 107 degree heat. Great fighters, as I said, always have a great fight left in them. And he had that in that fight. But by the 14th round, a cut over Frazier's good eye had left him nearly sightless in the ring. I couldn't, no, I couldn't see. No, it was gone. Mr. Futch said, Joe, I'm stopping the fight. My father said, Eddie, no, don't stop it, don't stop it. And Mr. Futch extended his right hand. He said, Joe, Joe, Joe. And then um, Pop sat down, and uh, that was the fight. Joe Frazier had fought his final championship round. But his children vowed to recapture the throne. I purposed in my heart that I was going to bring the championship of the world back to the Frazier family. Fathers want the sons to box, but uh, everybody said, can't box. 
big fellow there out of sight with Atlantic City. He didn't have him down. Oh, a long right hand. Well, look at that. He came down as an amateur Marvis Freeman. the first time in the pro. Frazier throws the first punch to left hook. It fell short, and Ali pushes him away. Frazier bobbing and weaving, moving those shoulders, shaking his head. Ali swings a left hook that Frazier blocks with his hand. The thrill in Manila with Muhammad Ali secured Joe Frazier's legend, even as it hastened the end of his career. The kind of fighter Joe Frazier is doesn't have a long career. Eight months later, while secretly wearing a contact lens, Frazier got back into the ring with George Foreman. But the lens popped out during the fight, which ended with another Foreman knockout. George had me down two about 14 times in the two fights maybe one of these days uh, i'll probably come out with a fraser grill and i'm gonna break it over his head i said pop i think it's time for you to hang gloves up <laughs> time to let it go i don't think he wanted to retire my father loves the excitement he loves the attention he loves people once that was the final. But tonight we're going to party and have a good time. We're going to take the roof off the house. Come on, fellas. Go to work for people out there. Joe hit the road as an entertainer, performing in Atlantic City in Las Vegas, and sharing the bill with singers like Philadelphia's Sonny Averone. Oh, what is a man? For what has he got? If not in then not sit and they teamed up together and they did a show called Still Smoking. And it was a great show and they both loved to sing. Joe Frazier loved to step on stage. The record shows we took the blows and did it But if Joe's boxing career was over, his kids had just begun to fight. The bad side of being uh, Joe Frazier's son was that everybody and their sister used to beat me up in school because I was I was Joe Frazier's son. So it really it was a rough deal. Me and Joe Frazier's kids, we got to fight, you know. And so, but we managed to actually beat up a couple of people in the neighborhood. So if they're watching, they'll remember this. <laughs> Joe's son, Hector, and his daughter, Jackie, would fight professionally. But it was Marvis, the family heavyweight, who followed directly in his father's footsteps, despite Joe's misgivings. He said, nah, son, you don't need that. Be a doctor, lawyer, and then chief, anything but a fighter. Dad doesn't want you to fight. Do something else, you know. Kids had a great life. They all went to school. They all smart. And uh, now you guys want to fight? Why? <laughs> but as Marvis moved up the ranks of heavyweight contenders, Joe moved into his corner. He knew me better than anybody else. He knows my ups, my downs, my lefts, my rights. He, he knew what made me tick. Who better to be in my corner except my dad? Some of the people says uh, Joe wants the kids to fight like him. You better learn to fight like me <laughs> if you will be champion, you know? Being, I don't know, uh, the son of uh, just Joe Frazier and being in his uh, footsteps, it's just something that, that I love, you know? And day to day, it just gives me a, the incentive to, to win. In 1983, Marvis got his wish. Chance for Marvis Frazier. Is he in above his head? a fight for the heavyweight crown against the champion, Larry Holmes. Marvis was a, a decent fighter. He fought some good guys coming in. He didn't have a lot of experience when he fought me, and he, his style was made for me. About a minute and five seconds in the first round, I dropped my hands, touched your boot. Boom! Larry caught me with a straight right hand. And Larry came back and hit me with about uh, um, 
about 14 unanswered uh, punches. Bill's laying the referee, hopefully giving him every chance, but it's all one way now. Late in the first round, the referee stopped the fight. And he stopped it in the opening round. No man in the world could be as low as I was at that moment in my life. Father came up to me, man, had a big smile on his face, had his arms open up like that, came up, hugged me, and he grabbed me and said, Hey, son, don't worry about it. Daddy loves you. You're my son. Got knocked down. I've been down there a couple times myself. <laughs> so, therefore, how you gonna get mad and give him, give him hell? No. He did his job. He did a fine job, and he tried. Joe Frazier's life had come full circle, but he had one more round to go. Frazier's here. Uh, Jim, don't nobody never recognize when I'm around. <laughs> Joe felt that Ali was not only the opponent in the ring, but even more so was an opponent in life. Joe still burns. You would, too. The playoffs could... We'll get it, Joe. We'll get whatever we get the jump box. All right, but you know, all I need is uh, get me a, a jumper. You got the key. Oh, who's got the key, me or you? You have the key. The life of a legend hasn't changed Joe Frazier's routine. He still does the things he loved as a kid. Boxing, singing, and tinkering with old cars. Little, little bit, Joe. Pull it. I've been a part of automobiles all my life because of dad. Dad was a hustler. Was, dad was a junk man. You know what it is, champ? It's the gas is old in it. Oh, it needs fresh gas. It's yeah, smoothing it out right now. I met Joe Frazier. It's got to be, I would say, 30 years ago. He was. Uh, he came down the junkyard looking for a rear in his car. What are we gonna do? Come on, smoke. We'll get on the forklift. And we became friends ever since. Oh. The people who walk in my office, and I'll say, you see those legs hanging out from under that Cadillac? He said, who's that? I said, that's Joe Frazier. You can't leave it that. All right, so you, don't want, you want me to move the Jaguar and bring the Cadillac in the back? Well, whatever you think is best, let's move it. I look at a car, a car like a friendship, a car like uh, your girlfriend, a car like your wife. If you don't take care of them, they're going to break down on you. <laughs> break down on you to leave you. In 1985, after 23 years, Joe and Florence's marriage ended in divorce. But Joe's side of the family keeps growing. He has 11 children. Behind every good man, there's a good woman. In my father's case, there's several good women. <laughs> it's 11 of us all together, and he is a father. He loves his children. I don't know. No other way to raise a child but with love. Joe Frazier, he rough tough. Joe Frazier is rough tough in the rim, but Joe Frazier is a very kind and loving person. Their three classic battles have forever linked Joe Frazier with Muhammad Ali. But Joe's bitterness at Ali's insults lasted longer than the bruises from their fights. Joe never understood why Muhammad had to push the envelope the way that he did. I said, Pop, you're a strong man. You got to forgive him, man, because what that does, if, if you don't let it go, it's going to destroy you. In 2002, friends brought the two legends together in public at the NBA All-Star Game in Philadelphia. Privately, they made their peace. He embraced Muhammad, uh, and they hugged for about five minutes, and Muhammad broke down and Joe broke down and we just all walked away and just let them you know, do their thing. We had some rugged years. We had some hard times. 
It's all over, man. It's yeah. done and gone. I hope the, the best for him. In downtown Philadelphia, there's a statue of a fictional champ from the movies, while the real champion, without fanfare, goes on about his business. He can call me up, and I go down. I can call him up. He'll come up, and Joe will do anything for anybody. We all, uh, as the world, are great fighters. We should have, we should have ourselves like a, a family relation, a whole big, a whole big week number of fighters party, having a good time. If you got a thousand people out there on autograph sign, I'll do that. My father says, you know, let the life that I live speak for me. I'm still going to be Joe Frazier and, and do the things that, you know, that Joe Frazier does. And that's touching people and touching lives and, and just being the guy that he is. He's a loving, kind person, a person that would take his, his coat off his back for someone else's shoes off his feet and food off the table for someone. That's my dad. Just like your father is your hero, he's my hero. It's just that you know him for his career in boxing and being one of the greatest boxers of all time. But he's a loving man. I think that the world like no smoking Joe's a, a fair guy, an honest guy, a real guy, a punting scam booger. And I love people.